Well, looks like we got a little hung up. I'm going to start that again, see if we can get going. There we go. Now I think I see what's happening here. Um, I'll pick up where we left off. can get that going again. There's 12 participants. Is that better? Oh, hold on. We'll go through this a little bit faster this time. Phenomena that occur in the long term species releases chemical compounds when you directly or indirectly affects other plant species. I don't know about you, but I feel like I remember birds that work better if I find out where it comes from. Alios one another, something that causes suffering from one to another. We're talking about, uh, let's see, keeps freezing up on me here. Let's see. So, actually, the term was coined by us, an Australian plant physiologist, Hans Bosch. There's our friend Hans right there. His last book published in 1937 was Der Unifus in Science of the Heliopathic.
transplanted later, then flown from one plant on another, Heliocarp. You know, the work it's only to 1937, the concept has been studied for thousands of years. Theocratus, a student of Aristotle, first wrote about plants influencing each other 350 years ago. I hope you're writing all this down because of the quiz at the end. The term is used to describe positive as a companion plant. Native American three sisters planted combined beans, fixed nitrogen in the soil, corn, and All right, folks, uh, can, can you hear me? Oh, I'll do my best to uh, talk. Not uh, The silent movie thing was cute for a few slides, but uh, <clears throat> you're going to have to listen to this. Hold on. You know, as it is so often the case in nature, <clears throat> there's always more to the story. And uh, uh, this hydrangea mystery, um, uh, 
the uh, a little bit the chemical in, in the black walnut tree is part of the story. But uh, after that article ran, I got an email. <clears throat> this is from um, a person named R. Shaw and lives in Elgin. And R. Shaw writes, uh, I live on a 50-foot lot in Elgin. 55 years ago, we bought this home and we inherited an old hydrangea plant. About 30 years ago, <clears throat> a tree began life just over the fence in a then empty lot. Little did I realize it was a black walnut. As it grew, I realized its ominous problems. <clears throat> Walnuts, from the immature ones in June, all season to the mature ones in late fall, were all over the lawn. I can totally relate to this because my dad, Herb, he used to shake his fist at the walnut tree that grew in front of his house. Um, he, um, he had a love-hate relationship with that big old walnut. Anyway, um, Arsha also adds that uh, I was well aware of the problems of gardens uh, had growing underneath them. <clears throat> I did some reading and I found some information, including info that hydrangeas can survive black walnuts. At least mine have. <clears throat> we haven't had any problems yet. These, of course, are the old-fashioned variety, and not like your beautiful ones. Best wishes to you and Herb. So look at this. After all this uh, research I did, uh, even the Morton Arboretum on their website had listed hydrangeas as being sensitive to black walnuts. Well, and our Shaw writes and has living proof that that's not the case. Here's another picture. <clears throat> hydrangeas in the foreground, walnut in the background. Yeah, doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, what do you do? Then you dig a little bit deeper. Oh, um, oh, hold on. Um, where's that? At? So um, there seems to be a slide missing here. Uh, there are different varieties of hydrangeas. Um, what uh, Mr. or Ms. Shaw has up in Elgin, that is hydrangea arborescence. Hydrangea arborescence is also known as wild hydrangea. I suspect it's a very old species that perhaps co-evolved. Uh, hold on. <clears throat> that perhaps co-evolved with the black walnut. What I have is a species called Hydrangea macrophylla, M-A-C-R-O. P-H-Y-L-L-A, macrophylla. <clears throat> uh, and it's also a, a, a cultivated variety. So it probably doesn't have what it takes to survive the juglone, which is the chemical that comes about when walnuts, uh, black walnuts specifically, are in an area. So uh, if you've got hydrangeas and black walnuts, it might be good to do a little research to see if you know what variety you have. Um, digging around, asking some more questions, I also learned that oak leaf hydrangea tends to not do well around black walnuts. So macrophylla and oak leaf hydrangea, neither one uh, does well around uh, black walnuts. However, the hydrangea arborescence Seems to have no problem at all. And there's the proof. Okay, now we're gonna go on. Um, I, I shot some video this past week of uh, things I found while I was walking around town. Um, and, you know, so much of what we do in nature is through our eyes, but it doesn't always have to be. Those of you who are birders know the value of birding by ear. Um, well, there's also um, just walking and listening and being present in the moment. Uh, take a listen to this next slide here. That's my dog, Joey. 
He's him and his, uh, my dad always called those his radar ears. He's going to help us figure out this sound puzzle. Okay, so this is a black, I'm sorry, a uh, honey locust tree uh, in my neighborhood. And this was, uh, I believe, either the third or fourth of July. Uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty hot out. It was the middle of the day. And uh, I had all three of my dogs with me, so naturally we had stopped at this tree. And it started making all kinds of noise. Let's see if I can get this to play. Turn it up. So you hear a cardinal calling. But you hear those other little voices? Let's stop it and bring it back again. Listen closely. There's a lot of little... Um, uh, almost like uh, <clears throat> cooing or squeaking from this area of the tree right here. Any guesses? Anybody have any guesses? You can almost see them coming out. Here he comes. Oh, there he goes. It was a, uh, a very young gray squirrel. It turns out that was the last of three to exit that nest. There are two more up uh, on the, another one of the trunks in this tree. Um, I think the, the dogs could hear them and smell them, and they could probably hear and smell the dogs. So. Uh, they exited that nest pretty quickly and ran up pretty high. Um, and an interesting thing, I walked by that nest again today <clears throat> in this area here where the, uh, where the hole is. That area um, has a whole lot of fresh uh, honey locust branches pulled into and around it. Now, I don't know if that was... Um, a means of freshening up the nest a little bit. A rodent nest, uh, especially this time of year, <clears throat> is a pretty heavy burden of ectoparasites. And by that, we're talking ticks and fleas and lice and mites, uh, all kinds of grungy things. So I don't know if uh, the, the fresh branches were meant to kind of spruce it up a little bit, or uh, maybe, you know, uh, squirrels often have more than one nest. It could be the squirrels went to another nest and somebody else moved in here. But I, know, I just thought it was really cool. It's a great reminder <clears throat> when you're out. You know, um, sometimes it's tempting to walk with uh, your headphones on or uh, if you're walking in a group, maybe you're may have paying more attention to the people you're with, which is a good thing. Uh, we need to uh, love our fellow man. But, um, and, you know, if you're by yourself, Give a listen uh, and see what you might be able to find. Now, uh, we're going to go to another slide. This was, um, hold on. This was, um, uh, let's see, I think this was uh, Friday night. So it would have been July 2nd. And this was late. This was about 11 o'clock or so. In uh, a few more slides, you'll see what I was up to. <clears throat> but you can see here, um, I was walking the fine streets of St. Charles. This is a storm drain. This was actually at the corner of uh, 4th and uh, Walnut Streets on the west side of town. Here we've got a uh, tech support puppy. That's Boker. Here's the ears you saw before. This is my Joey. And they practically pulled me over to this storm sewer. Now let's, uh, let's give a listen again. See if you can figure out what's going on in the storm drain. Ready? Uh oh Oh, no, I gave it away. Hold on. Let me try again. There we go.
All right, that chattering sound. Hear that? Well, listen to it one more time, even though you know what the answer is. Listen to it one more time so you get to know this sound. The dogs uh, drove me to it, but once we started listening, I, I really tried to see if I could get my phone down in those grates. Uh, but then any of you who know me know that me holding a phone over a storm drain with water in it is not a good idea. So I, I um, good, the good sense kicked in and I uh, stepped back. I didn't get a good image of uh, the critter in the storm drain. Um, but uh, this is who it was. It was a, a raccoon. Uh, it looked like a small raccoon. I would say maybe an adolescent. I actually contacted Public Works because I didn't know, um, you know, was it stuck? It seemed to go away the more we stood and listened. And at first I thought maybe it was just quiet <clears throat> because there was a human and three dogs looking down at it. But then... Um, uh, the, the, I saw my flashlight in there, and I, I finally decided that it had moved on. Uh, public Works, they said they do get calls uh, to rescue animals. But I also think that raccoons are one of probably several animals that uses storm drains as a kind of a conduit to get from place to place. If you can stand your feet being wet. Remember, these are... <clears throat> These are storm drains, not sanitary sewers. So it's rainwater, and it's, it's not pure rainwater by any means. The stuff that's on the street gets washed into these big pipes. But um, it's not the nasty sanitary sewer stuff either. So uh, when you think about it, <clears throat> you know, you can either run around town, you know, cross state highways like 31 and 64, or you can take the underground route. I know some of you are U of I graduates. I think there's a little analysis or uh, analogy here between uh, raccoons and storm drains and students in uh, the steam tunnels down at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Think about that. But anyway, um, also uh, give a listen if you happen to be out at night. Uh, I think uh, muskrats might do this too, and there might be other animals as well that are moving around town in our storm sewers. Just a little food for thought. Now, um, I found this <clears throat> little uh, gif and I, I had to share it. It's not really the shock of your life. This is actually uh, some footage that you could take yourself. Uh, this is an annual occurrence. But these are really neat little creatures, and I look forward to seeing them every year. Now, this is the reason, uh, what we're going to see on the next slide, that's the reason I was prowling around downtown St. Charles at 11 o'clock at night the other night. I should also add, <clears throat> I should also add that our uh, officer, Mr. Tim Timberlake, he used to play a game here at the Park District, and it was called Junkie in the Park or Pam Otto. And he would say to the group, he'd say, okay, uh, uh, eating food out of a trash can, Junkie in the Park or Pam Otto? Pam Otto. Asleep on a park bench, Junkie in the Park, Pam Otto. So he might have added another round to that game the other night because uh, there was uh, Pam Otto prowling around the playground uh, in Lincoln Park. Um, if you can picture uh, Lincoln Park, it's in downtown St. Charles between uh, 4th and 5th Streets on the north side of Main Street, which is Route 64. That's where concerts in the park are held every year, um, except for this year. Um, there's a playground down the north end of the park that is used heavily by kids whose families are at those concerts. 
It's also used by the kids who go to St. Pat's preschool. Um, that's not the only things using the park at St. Pat's, uh, across from St. Pat's though. Uh, here we have our creature of the week. <laughs> you can hear my creatures panting in the background. Um, and we got another video that's slightly longer. These were almost as big as my thumb. And uh, we get a good look at him here. Let's see if I can pause this. It's a... Uh, this is the stag beetle, Lucanus capriolus. Uh, Lucania is a uh, part of southern Italy. Uh, Pliny the Elder, uh, for some reason, uh, maybe they have a lot of stag beetles in southern Italy. I don't know. There's actually some stag beetles in Europe that are considered endangered now because of the loss of uh, the practice of taking out dead trees. Uh, caused a lot of these beetles to disappear because, um, as we're about to see, dead wood plays an integral part in their life cycle. Um, you might recognize these. Uh, they're grubs, but they're way bigger than those pesky Japanese beetle grubs you might find in your lawn. Uh, here's um, my hand here on the right. I'm holding a stag beetle grub. Uh, we had several that we raised in the uh, Nature Center office a few years ago, uh, and they feed on dead wood. It is an astounding digestive process because they are able to break down parts of the wood that uh, most other creatures can't, and that is essential to the, the decomposition and the returning of that dead wood to soil. Uh, makes for very fertile soil. You're probably familiar with the castings that uh, earthworms leave behind. Well, I can tell you <clears throat> the castings of stag beetle larvae, and there's some other, there's actually several other scarab beetle larvae that <clears throat> produce a very nutritious casting um, or poop, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> if any of you are interested, you can let me know. I have uh, a guide that was produced, I believe it was 1925, that tells you how to key out these different types of beetle larvae. Uh, something that's kind of integral to uh, learning what beetle you're looking at is to look at their hindquarters here. Some of them have uh, a slit back here that's uh, horizontal and others have a slit that's vertical that will affect the shape of the dropping um, and uh, also aid in your identification. Um, I'll also say I'm planning to go back to uh, St. Pat's tonight because uh, let's back this up a couple of slides here. Let's go back to that video. Um, can you see the large pinchers here? Stag beetles are also known as pinching bugs. And uh, I can tell you from personal experience, they really do pinch. Uh, these guys can draw blood, uh, just small little pinpricks of blood, but it, it's pretty painful. Um, those uh, large uh, mandibles there are used for uh, wrestling with other stag beetle. Um, when I was at, um, Lincoln Park the other night, I only saw males. So I'm curious, and I haven't been able to find an answer yet, but you know, with a lot of our bird species, the males come back to the breeding territory first, and then the females come later. A great example of that is the red-winged blackbird. Um, I don't know if it's the same with beetles. It might be. And whether it's a seasonal thing where they come out a few weeks before and wrestle each other, or whether they come out earlier in the evening. Maybe I wasn't, since I wasn't there until 2 o'clock in the morning, maybe I didn't see the females. I don't know, but I only saw males that night. 
Um, <clears throat> so um, that kind of folds into kind of the next part of my kind of nefarious scheme. I do want to go back and see if I can find some females. I would like to collect some and set up a breeding colony because they have a multi-year life cycle. These grubs are in this stage for several, I wouldn't say three years, um, because they're, they have to get quite large and they do a lot of processing in the meantime. They do are very beneficial in turning dead wood back into soil. Uh, so yeah, working on starting a breeding colony, uh, if you happen to know of any dead logs that have large beetle grubs in them, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll pay you a visit. So um, besides beetle season, <clears throat> it's also moth season. This is another email I received. Uh, let's see if I can find the text for it here. Um, okay, this is from Betty and Paul Hearth. Uh, out in Hampshire, Illinois. And uh, they write, Hi Pam, we came across this big guy, or maybe gal, while walking our two dogs the other day near our home in Hampshire. I looked it up on the internet and I believe it is a cecropia or robin moth. And they're exactly right. Uh, robin moth is the British term for this species. Here in the States, we tend to call them cecropias, but robin moth works too. She continues, I don't ever recall seeing a moth this big. I put my glasses next to it so you can have some perspective on its size. It was on the sidewalk, apparently trying to dry out from an overnight thunderstorm. We left it there and continued walking after taking its picture. I hope it made it back home. I thought you might appreciate seeing this photo. Um, blah, blah, blah. Keep up the good work, blah, Betty and Paul Hart. So um, yes, this is a Cecropia moth. It's part of the giant silk moth family that we have here in uh, North America. Um, I looked a little closer. I blew up uh, their image. I looked at the head area. This is a fun thing to do with uh, several types of moths, not just the silk moths. But uh, if you noticed your moth has uh, let me get the pointer on here. You notice your moth has feathery antennae like this does here. You can tell whether it's a boy or a girl. These antennae are used to sense chemicals in the air. The pheromones that are the chemical attractants between the sexes in these moths. The males have large feathery antenna and the females have thinner, they're still kind of feathery, but they're much, much thinner. So I suspect that this is a female. And uh, like Betty and Paul said, I, I hope that she was able to find her way off the pavement there and hopefully uh, made a lot more little cecropias before she was called off to the big cocoon in the sky. Um, now, the thing with cecropias, um, just like with the beetles we talked about, those grubs are in that stage for years. The uh, Cecropia caterpillar is in the caterpillar stage for a year. Uh, it spends one entire growing season um, eating and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then it... Um, it forms a cocoon, it overwinters in that stage, and when it comes out in the spring, it's a moth. Except, well, yeah, it's a moth. But there's a big difference um, between an a adult of a moth caterpillar and an adult of a butterfly caterpillar. Um, the sil silk moths, <clears throat> here, referring specifically to silk moths, they are so large, and they're the caterpillars that get to be, you know, index finger size, big, thick, green caterpillars. Um, they do all their eating then, they get their fat stores built up. When they emerge as an adult silk moth, they don't eat anymore. They can't eat anymore. They don't even have mouth parts anymore. They can't eat. 
So they're praying. Like their only duty in this life stage is to find a mate and make some babies. And then they're done. Now, uh, when I say giant silk moths, um, you might be familiar with some other uh, representatives. Um, uh, I'll tell you what, let me go ahead here. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, the uh, Cecropia and the Polythemus and the Luna. Again, I'm missing a slide, I'm sorry. But Polythemus moths are, uh, uh, they, we saw several of those uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, uh, the Luna moth you might be familiar with as well. They are uh, the large green moths. Um, they are, um, uh, let's see if I can pull up a photo here. Uh, they're, they're kind of a um, greenish yellow. Um, there we go. They've got long tails on their bodies. I'll pull this up. I don't know if it's, it's in the camera or not, but uh, Luna moths, Polythemus moths, Cecropia moths, are, those are the kind of the main giant silk moths that we have in this area. Um, now, it was interesting, uh, the, the Cecropia moths, I don't see as many of, but I tend to hang out in woods, mature oak and hickory woodlands. Um, Cecropias, are subject to a lot of predation in those habitats because look at their cocoon. It's kind of flimsy. There's a lot of silk here um, and there might be some leaf material here. It, it's usually attached to a branch of some sort, but um, looks kind of like a paper bag. Uh, the Polythemus and the Luna, they, um, they're, uh, cocoons are, are hard-sided. The silk that they produce is pretty substantial. Uh, not to say that they don't get predated by um, different uh, animals, uh, but a, a big predator of Cecropia cocoons are white-footed mice. And um, so uh, Oak Hickory Woodlands, we have a lot of mice in our woodlands. Um, they tend to eat a lot of these cocoons. But in newer neighborhoods, uh, newer subdivisions, which again, you think the habitat might not be so great, but they do sometimes plant uh, hardwoods, um, maples and things like, uh, and oaks and things like that. Uh, those are food for the Cecropia. Um, and so where we tend to see Cecropias more are in more recently disturbed areas or newer types of neighborhoods. So uh, that was pretty neat. I was so thankful that they shared those photos with us. Okay, now we'll go on. Um, we had another moth in the news and another email. Check this out. Now, just for perspective, that moth is the size of my hand. Uh, this is a, a somewhat unusual species. It's not native to Illinois. We are not, though, worried that it's invading because it doesn't uh, seem to occur here as a caterpillar. It uh, gets caught up in um, uh, wind currents. You know, it gets taken up into thermals, and that can aid its flight. But it actually lives um, in South America. Um, in the uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, this is called the black witch moth. And um, they are uh, very occasional visitors to this area. Um, this is from uh, August Arno. Um, he says, hello. Uh, a reader of Good Natured in the King County Chronicle encouraged me to contact you with the spine. I caught this moth on my back porch this evening. It's a good six inches long. After some Googling, I identified it as a female black witch moth. Um, apparently, uh, they are rare. She's a pretty unusual visitor. 
would you be interested in some pictures? I said, absolutely. Um, they, they do uh, occur infrequently in this area, but um, this isn't the first time we've had them in this area. Um, they, um, again, they, they get caught up in, in these wind turns. I, I actually took a picture of one that was very frayed and tattered over in the picnic shelter at Leroy Oaks Forest Preserve in the summer of 2017. Um, the one that August found, you can see, is actually in pretty good shape. Uh, they do occur in some of the southern states, so maybe this one didn't have to fly quite as far. Um, the first time I saw one was also in a picnic shelter uh, that was down at Red Oak Nature Center, and it would have been in the early 2000s when I worked there. We were actually getting prepared uh, to do a bat program. I saw this big dark thing up near the, the roof of the pavilion, and uh, I made a note to check it out later. Well, as people started coming into the pavilion for the, uh, the bat program, they thought it was a bat because it was that big. It was very dark. I believe that would have been the male black witch moth. Um, if you Google black witch, besides learning about the species, you can also learn about the folklore uh, in some cultures. The black witch moth and its appearance uh, portends a coming death. Uh, in other cultures, sometimes it means money is on the way. So they call it the money moth. Um, so it's, it's a really neat sort of a creature. And uh, one that, uh, even though it's, it's considered very rare in this area and it's not known to reproduce this far north, they do tend to make it up this way. And I think, um, you know, when we see a lot of disturbance in the atmosphere, when we see storms coming from the south, I think that draws these moths. I think they get pulled in to those uh, currents, air currents, and that's how they end up up here in this area. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, I wonder where I put it. That's the polyphemus moth, and this next one is the luna moth. I'm sorry, folks, those got out of sequence, but uh, when we were talking about the giant silk moths, the polyphemus moth um, has uh, these uh, feathery antennae that we talked about. This is clearly a male. Look at the size of these things. Uh, this was from a cocoon that was dropped off at the nature center and I somewhat foolishly forgot to put it in a cool place. So it spent the winter on my desk and it hatched in April instead of May when they normally do. So this poor guy, he hung out, uh, he was free from predation, um, and, but he was also uh, not able to find a mate. He lived his entire week long lifespan there um, in my office. It was kind of fun when people would come in and flap towards them. Uh, that's another story. Um, yeah, and uh, here's a luna moth. Again, also a male, but, which you can tell by these uh, feathery antennae. Uh, you know, uh, looking at the markings here, don't these kind of look like eyes? Let's go back. Don't these kind of look like eyes? When you see these moths, even if they're at rest, sometimes they'll adopt this posture because this can be quite scary to a potential predator. If it goes, if the back of the moth goes from being just kind of brown and innocent looking, with maybe tiny eyes, to these large scary eyes, uh, there's a chance that a predator might be scared away and will leave these guys alone. Uh, same too, uh, to a lesser extent here with our luna moth, but these barkings are thought to replicate eyes that can be used to uh, defend the moth that would otherwise be defenseless. All right, so a uh, few of you had suggested that it would be helpful to know what uh, we've got planned in the coming weeks. I don't want to give everything away, but uh, the column that's coming up uh, this Thursday is going to talk about a very interesting, when I say curious, I mean interesting and unusual and kind of unheard of in our area, visitor. I have blacked his face out to protect his identity. But um, we're gonna uh, in, explore the, uh, the biology of this curious creature here. Uh, we're gonna take a look at lightning bugs because believe it or not, we have several different kinds 
um, and not all of them are blinky. Some of them are very um, uh, not obvious in their habits and actually fly around in the daytime. So we're going to take a look at some uh, lightning bug species and help you learn to identify those. Um, now, you know, those of you who have been with us all along know that I'm kind of cicada happy. We're done with periodical cicadas, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief there. But uh, you've probably heard the last few days, the annual cicadas have started up. We have a few species in this area that are very, very similar when you look at them. But once they start making their songs, once they start calling to attract a female, they're very different. So we're gonna go through some sound files next week and we're gonna get to know our, our singing friends, the cicadas. Uh, I was reminded a few days ago about the bat life we have in this area. I've actually gotten several emails about bats, but they've mostly been that how do I get rid of type of email. People are finding bats uh, in their attics, which, um, <clears throat> our great uh, nursery colony sites for our big brown and our little brown bats, which are colonial bats. By colonial, we mean not that they're from the 1700s, but rather that they live in colonies. The females form nursery colonies, the males form bachelor colonies. But we also have uh, bat species in this area that don't do that. They only live in trees. They're called the solitary bats. And there's a couple of those I'd like to introduce you to. Of course, you never know what's going to come across the desk here at the nature headquarters. We'll probably have a few more things too, but that's just a look at what's coming up next week. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to stop uh, sharing the screen. I'm going to open it up to see if any of you might have any questions. I'll turn the chat on. We've got our chat function here. All right. All right. Yeah. Hurricane winds in Alburn. <laughs> and Sarah, you guys probably saw these and I missed them. Uh, yes, for the three sisters, um, that was corn and beans and squash are the three sisters that uh, um, grow nicely together. Um, and yes, uh, the, the toxins in black walnuts, good point, Kate. They are not just toxic to plants, they can kill animals too. Um, if that uh, plant matter, whether it's the leaves or the nuts, if they're allowed to, to build up in a stock tank or in a pond, that can be deadly. Um, so the female stag beetles, let's go back. Um, I'll go back to that slide. That's a good question, Sue. Um, let's go back here. I'm going to show you the... Uh, mandibles because that's how you tell the difference. Um, this is actually Jill Votel. Um, ah, boy, technology. Tech support puppy is sound asleep so I'm on my own. Um, <laughs> there we go. All right so look at these small mandibles. I know they, they look substantial but they're thick and they're not very long. Okay, so now this doesn't help because it's just the female, but I sort of wondered if somebody would be curious about the males. And um, so let me, um, let me stop the share here. Try to stop the share. Uh, can't stop the share. <laughs> there we go. All right, so behind me, you know, I didn't just walk around St. Pitt's and, uh, and around uh, Lincoln Park and, and not pick anything up. So um, bear with me for a minute here. Um, see what we can find. Um, believe it or not, online there are care sheets for how to care for uh, stag beetles. And uh, they don't uh, eat a whole lot in their adult uh, form, but they do eat um, overripe fruit. 
and they will also sip dilute uh, maple syrup, not log cabin or the high fructose kinds of corn syrup, but uh, or uh, uh, maple syrup. But if you've got uh, real maple syrup, put a little water in it, and uh, they will drink that. Now, um, I was hopeful to find some help. All right, here's a mail. <laughs> Much bigger those mandibles are. Uh, check out those antennae too. Stag beetles get their name because stag is another name for male deer. In fact, uh, Lucanus capriolus, which is the species, capriolus actually means little goat. And in Europe, um, the roe deer, uh, which is a smaller form of deer that they have over there, is their name is Capriolus Capriolus. So uh, when they named this, they were going for that analogy to the antennae looking like uh, the antlers of a deer. So look at the size of these mandals. Um, I don't know. I really don't want to take one for the team. Like I said, I got pinched pretty good the other night. <laughs> I don't know if I can get him to hold on here. Yeah, no, he's not going to. He wants my flesh. But anyway, well, now the other ones are waking up. I actually picked up a few. Uh, let's see. There's another one. You see, there's a little bit of size difference. This one's bigger, this one's a little bit smaller, but they both have the large mandibles. So these are both males. But you can find these. If you've got, now that I think um, the advantage that the playground at Lincoln Park offers is that it's in the shade. And so the, the wood chips stay pretty moist and there's a lot of decomposition that occurs. Um, they uh, uh, Parks crew, I know, has to replenish those wood chips every year because they break down so much. Um, but um, I'm going to head back there again tonight. I'm going to put these guys back, and I'm going to see if I can find a few more and see if I can get that breeding colony going. Um, I've got a collector's permit, so it's all legal. But <laughs> I'll keep you uh, posted on the... Uh, how the uh, the colony of uh, stag beetles comes along. Okay, great question from you, Betty. What other moth predators besides mice? So yeah, mice will uh, take advantage of the uh, the, the cocoons. Uh, in the caterpillar stage, there's a lot of birds, especially when the caterpillars are small, because these things, they come out of an egg that's um, oh, about the size of uh, a little bit bigger than a pencil point, um, maybe a, a tiny little bead. But um, so birds will eat the caterpillars when they're small. Uh, they can catch them when they're bigger. Sometimes they'll eat those too, but there's a lot of uh, ornamentation on some of the caterpillars that makes them not so tasty. Um, as adults, if you want to have some fun this week, look up the relationship between moths and bats. Now, the giant silk moths, they don't fly uh, great distances, but they, they do fly some. Um, bats, you know, they're pretty well known for eating uh, mosquitoes, but mosquitoes are tiny little snacks. A bat would much prefer something big and juicy. Like a moth, uh, uh, bats find their food through echolocation, and they can send sound signals out that will bounce off of a bat and come, uh, bounce off of a moth and come back to the bat's ear. And the bat can get closer and closer to the moth using echolocation and then finally grab that moth and eat it. So bats are, bats are big uh, predators of moths. Um, moths though, there's several species who have actually developed over many millennia uh, ears. So they can hear those echolocations and they drop down when they hear them 
and made for attempts to catch them. So it's just awesome. You know, there's so many relationships out there. Some of them we're just now starting to learn about. Um, there's also, I think, something with naturalists and, and beetles, because I know a lot of people who go and try and collect these guys. So <laughs> there's a, a relationship that's evolving there as well. Um, any other questions? Yes, thank you. There's a comment on, um, and you know, actually, you know, some um, the ancient Egyptians would often wear scarab beetles as jewelry. Some of the scarabs are, and by scarab, I know my voice makes it sound like carob, but I'm actually saying scarab, S-C-A-R-A-B. Scarab beetles are lovely. A lot of them are emerald green. They'll have some um, uh, turquoise highlights sometimes, or they'll have some red or, or contrasting orange. And the ancient Egyptians would actually clamp, they would clamp on and they would wear them as, uh, as jewelry. Now, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't know if I could get a close up here. You can see the claws on the feet. This guy's not letting go anytime soon. I'm just glad it's his feet and not his pinchers. <laughs> There's that awesome antenna again. All right. Any other questions tonight? Um, if not, <clears throat> I have a question for you all. You can message me privately, but if you've got a cure for laryngitis, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Drinking honey and tea with honey and uh, my elderflower cordial. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, I thought, you know, elderberries, they've got a lot of medicinal qualities to them. I don't know, this is, this is tasty, but I... I don't know if I sound any better now than I did an hour ago, but uh, yeah. I'm hoping I kick this soon. Um, and I, you know, since we're doing this remotely, you guys are all safe from whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Craig and Kelly. Um, well, I will get uh, you answers to your questions next week too. But yeah. We got a real fun show planned for next week, and I'll look forward to seeing you all then. All right. Till then, oh, I'll wave like this. <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. Take care. You too. Take care. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thanks, Pam. Well, yeah.